Welcome back to the Chatters Box. My name is Kyle McClellan, your host, and today we are joined by Cardinals great and legend Gary Gaetti. <laughs> Gary, thank you so much for stepping into the Chatters Box and spending some time here. Uh, let's start off with why Why are you uh, back in town? Well, I was invited back here for the, the flavor of the month, you know, with the alumni program that they have going on, but I also have a I have a home in my hometown, Central Illinois, and I have a baseball academy over there, so I come back and forth, you know, at least you know a couple times a month. So it's always good to be back at the ballpark. Yeah, always. absolutely. And and I know you're you're signing today uh, as a part of the Bud Bash, and you're, and you're uh, <laughs> you know going to get to see the fans and that. But I mean, from you know, you spent a couple years with the Cardinals, played you know a ton of years in the big leagues, 18, 19, 20 years in the big leagues. And then, but to have two years here with St. Louis, but to be welcome back, you know, I, we we're around alumni all the time, and they always talk about just you know how they make you feel, you know, so great here and have a special day for you in the first pitch. I mean, what, what's that like, uh, getting invited back by by the Cardinals? I love it, absolutely love it. I love coming to the ballpark, and uh, I was talking to the the girl that worked the you know the security you know entrance out there, and just telling her how much I loved being back here, you know, and just. I mean, I grew up, you know, 70 miles from here, and yep. just, I mean, the Cardinals were my team, and, you know, Brock and Gibson, McCarver, Shannon, and just, you know, then being able to come back and play, it was just, like, fantastic. I love coming over here. Last week when the Twins were in town, that might be a touchy subject for some people, but it's <laughs> like, you know, my son was taking a road trip with my grandson, and they, you know, they invited me over to come to the games, and it's just like, anytime you get a chance to come to Bush Stadium, it's like, it's way worth it, and just a, just a blast. And I will say this about the Cardinals, that just making their former players, you know, I don't care if it's one year, two year, whatever, feel like, you know, family and part of it. I mean, I really feel like I'm part of the Cardinals family, you know. And it's easy to root for them. And, it's, you know, it's never a problem to come and do something like this or just, you know, because I, I, I know the people and it's just, you know, I know the people in the area and why the Cardinals fans are the greatest in the world and, you know, glad to be part of it. Well, we're excited to have you back. And I was telling you briefly before we went on here that, you know, kind of my background, but it grew mm -hmm. up in St. Louis. Uh, you know, when you were here, uh, you know, I was a kid, you know, watching you grow up. And, man, I can't – when you walked in here, I was help, hoping you were going to have your helmet on with the no <laughs> flap, right? I mean, that you, like you had the I look. Know, I and know. You had the look in the night. When you were playing for the Cardinals, you, you were like the coolest look. Uh, <laughs> but you had to be one of the last guys to wear the no I flap, was. right? I was the last guy. And it's kind of a funny story because – when I broke into the big leagues in 82, I I wasn't given a choice, but according to the rules, I had a choice to go flapless. And uh, after I'd played 10 years in the big leagues, I, I petitioned the league. Bobby Brown was the president. I petitioned the league and said, hey, I will, I'll hold you harmless. You know, I just want to wear the flapless helmet because I liked it and my heroes had worn it and I'm not worried about getting hit in the ear. And, and it was just cool. And, and it really, as a player, it's like, I'm surprised more players don't do that. I mean, it, the rules are the rules, but I'm saying Ozzy wore a flat, you know, the flapless. I was going to say, he, he was the other one that I remember had had the flapless. There are advantages to it. It's weird. I got hit in the head, but I never got hit in the head without a flap, you know, and it's just one of those things, just that old school bad to the bone, you yeah. know, and it's, the funny side story is like Eddie Vedder came here and put on a concert and he was out shagging some fly balls with us and whatever, and he liked my helmet. I said, well, here, why don't you just take it? So he wore it in his concert that night, you know, which was oh, really awesome. pretty neat, so. I totally got you wearing it, like leaving the field, jumping on a motorcycle, and just keeping <laughs> just keeping the Cardinal helmet on. You know, like it's just the same thing. Like like with like back you, you back in the nineties when when I hear the name Gary Gaddy, man, that's what I think. I was like, surely he rode a motorcycle and he just rocked that helmet that's when right. he left the ball field and went straight to it. I but uh, great memories uh, of of me growing up watching you, you know that era, uh, you included in that. But you know you had. Uh, looking you up before we came in here your your career is i mean you you had a, a heck of a career i got a couple accolades here written down four-time gold glove uh silver slugger in 95 you ace alcs mvp uh, in in uh, 1987 against the yes. cardinals world series championship against the cardinals there in 87 two-time all-star in the minnesota twins hall of fame and I don't have the number down. I believe over 2,200 hits yes. uh, in your career, and all all the things that go with it. But uh, and, and played for you know for such a long time at the big league. I mean, it's amazing when you look at that. Does that, does that ever blow you away? I mean, sitting here now today, looking back and thinking of all those I mean, those accolades. It's kind of weird to see it like that. But I mean, I was just a play. I just went out and played. You know, I just played every day and never really thought about the numbers and whatever it was. I just wanted to play and win and be part of a winning organization and 
you end up with you know some of the numbers like that and it's just it's just i'm blessed i'm ble- i was blessed physically to be able to do that you know and play those kind of games and you know that many years and had a lot of good teammates and you know good and managers and instructors and just like i said if you love the game you're going to play it as long as you can basically and that's yeah. what happened you know to be able to come back to st louis after many years in the big leagues and be a part of this was just it was a dream i had i'd be standing out on the field and i know i've mentioned this before but i'd i'd smell the that's exactly what it smelled like when i was like yeah. eight years old over here you know yeah. it's like it's just a warm fuzzy feeling and I actually had a friend of mine gave me a bat that was left he bought my mom and dad's house and somebody there was a bat in there and he said hey i got a bat of yours it's like well, i don't remember giving you a bat and he's and dick schofield was taking batting practice i was just over here as a little kid and we we're all screaming hey mr schofield autograph and he handed me this bat and it is this giant club <laughs> 36 36 it's still got the nail holes where i nailed it back together it's just like what a what a nice little piece of memorabilia that is to have from the yeah. time when I was a little kid. It's just like same thing, you know. It's like it's nice to go back, but I'm I'm just saying, I don't think about the numbers like that so much. But you know, I'm saying just being part of this organization has been enough for me. Yeah, in your time here, let's talk about your time here in St. Louis. We can talk about you know when you broke in with the Twins and and really kind of burst on the scene there. But your time here was a transition time here in St. Louis, right? I mean, so. You're at the end of Joe Torrey's. You're at the beginning yes. of, of Tony's. Tony. You were here for Tony's first year. Yeah. And I've heard some stories. I played for Tony, but I've heard some stories about Tony coming in that first year and trying to trying to kind of change that culture, kind of, you know, establish himself as the leader. I mean, what what was that transition like from Torrey to, to Tony in that, that well, time Well, I competed against Tony many times when he was with Oakland, even before that when he was in Chicago and um, had a lot of respect for him as a manager and i love him as a manager i mean he could kind of say some kind of weird stuff like hey tony how you doing i'll let you know about 10 yeah, so what's you know, that yeah, huh? i'll let you know after the game yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he was always prepared he and for he sure. had us prepared and he would say the right things at the right time and if you didn't like tony you probably just had a problem yourself you know what i'm saying he was fair he had your back i know that for sure and i know they were, they were going through a lot of changes with the anheuser mm-hmm. you know bush family selling and you know the DeWitts taking over and I got to know a lot of the owners there so I'm saying that transition I love being part of it and we had a dynamite team in 96 we should have went, went to the World Series it just we just couldn't finish the Braves off but yeah. man well the first I love that, that, 20, was, that was the first NLC NL NL Central Championship yes. since they That's divided right. into three That's divisions right, right? That's right. so that was the first year in 96 yep. you guys got that you're up 3-1 on the Braves if I remember right yep. is that right going yep. in yep. aren't able to finish it off in that year but like you said a heck of a team in, in that Great stretch team. one of the best teams i've ever played on and and we deserve to win the braves know that too <laughs> so you gotta you gotta play it out you know yep. what i'm saying I'm, i can tell you what my analysis was you know bringing guys back on three day you know short rest and i i don't want to go there but i'm saying yeah i got to experience that and i was just like we're going we're going serious it just, it just didn't happen but still so one of the best teams i ever played on a couple years before that was the strike uh, I was a player rep when I was here with the Cardinals, and and so uh, appreciate and understand what you guys went through in that time. There's probably a lot of people listening to this podcast that might not know about that big strike in baseball yeah. and what you guys did. Uh, if you don't mind, share just a little bit about you know that process. Of what, what do you do? You know, like at the time there, I've, I've heard stories that go guys are going back and they're you know they're getting jobs and they're working and they're trying to figure yeah, out. But I mean that was a that was a pivotal moment in baseball history and what you guys were were trying to do and, and set forth for for guys like me in the in the future and in, in coming after you and you guys um held the line for a long time and, and kind of changed the game for sure well the i mean don fear and marvin miller i mean they were good leaders in that regard and you know they kept the union together and i'm not necessarily a union guy but at that time i was like you know we're a group we're this right. particular group and you know hearing everything on the inside you know it's it's always been the it's always been the same couple things each year where you know when the labor agreement comes up for negotiation it's like it's always been about free agency and arbitration and service time and all that kind of stuff you know and it was a real i was in a flux i didn't know what to do i didn't know whether i was in kansas city i didn't know whether to stay in kansas city or go home i ended up going home because we didn't see an end in sight right 
you know, but we knew we were going to stay, you know, strong. And I think it's one of the only times that we've ever had to, uh, uh, the union actually had to reimburse some of the, you know, licensing money that was held over just in, in those instances, you know. It's really sad, though, that you didn't have a World Series that year, yeah. you know. Well, there's a lot of guys that, that came you know, just getting their career started. I know. And, and it, you know, it put a put an end to a lot of them, you know. You know, it was just, it was just that was, that was a bad time. But, um, I mean, you see how popular baseball is. I mean, it survived that and then came back stronger than ever, yeah. you know, but still – just just a really weird time and i'd been through a couple strikes before too and it was same same thing you know we just had to stay strong and you know it's too bad it had to happen but like i said every four years yeah i don't know if it's eight years now but every four years <laughs> yeah. you got to kind of go through that what'd you do during that time to, to, to actually i just was doing landscaping and stuff in my house and trying to stay active and i didn't do a lot of you know whatever i First time I picked up a bat, I you know was at spring training, you know, yeah. and had one of the best years of my life. But it's like, <laughs> I don't want to say that's why, but you know, we just didn't know when it was going to happen again, and you know, and then we went through the uh, replacement players and all that kind of stuff yeah. too. So that was just weird. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, weird time for sure. But yeah. uh, so let, let's go back to 1979. You're in Elizabeth and Elizabeth Town, playing for the Twins. Now, I, when I saw this, I was like, man brought back memories i've been in right. the appalachian league i was there in 2002 2003 and then later in 2006 when during a rehab uh played there and i can promise you the way you left the stadium in 1979 it is the exact same as when <laughs> i saw it they haven't changed anything my parents would come to uh come to the minor league games every once in a while they brought my grandparents and uh there was we were in elizabeth and elizabeth town and they had um hillbilly horseshoes is what they play so really? they had the toilet seats uh, nice. They would have the fans come out and throw in between innings. You know, you had all these little gimmicks. They had a uh, horse racing that they had. These people would run with the horses on a stick That's behind good. the wall, and it was—I mean, they were the, it was the worst entertainment ever. And then they had uh, I th I, his name was like Monkey Boy or Monkey Man or something. He had the worst outfit and the worst suit, and he would come. But it was totally rookie ball, right? That's I mean, it was like in, in the Appalachian League. Man, I have so many memories there. Unfortunately, it's not still in minor league baseball they've, they've taken it out but um so many memories there uh but you start there in elizabeth town and i saw that i was like man i got to bring that up but then you know go on to minnesota and i mean that's really where you burst on the scene made a name for yourself um i mean some great years over there in the in the minnesota twins hall of fame um you know talk about kind of those early years and 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 what you were learning how you developed into the player that you ended up becoming well there weren't a lot of great years. I mean, my first year in the big leagues, we lost 102 games, and we lost 14 in a row. And as I look down the bench at the manager and just go, "Oh my God, what you know? What are we doing to this guy?" You know, and it's just, it was hard. But they let us learn through the struggle. You know that you know. I guess they had enough confidence in us seeing us that you know eventually we're going to be a good team. And then, um, you know, every organization makes adjustments during the year. I mean, the Cardinals are going through it right now. But, you know, they put the right pieces together, you know, at the right time for us. And we'd had enough experience and got our ba brains beat in so many times. It's like, you know, we could handle it. And we had a bunch of guys that played every day and, you know, not injured and not playing for stats and all that kind of stuff. And we came together as a team and had the right pieces, you know, with the bullpen and, and uh, starting rotation. And, you know, we just – I still – even in the 87s, so I don't think we were the best team. The Tigers were the best team in baseball. And the Cardinals were sh without Pendleton, Clark, and Coleman. And so it's like, it was Providence for us, basically. But still, you know, coming up through the Twins organization was... I loved it because I got to know my teammates. And we played to have fun and just, you know, I mean, developed... Even though we did, we didn't have a lot of winning years. You know, we got to that place, and I'd say this to any major league team out there: if you make it to the tournament, all bets are off. Yeah. And we we railroaded, mm -hmm. you know, both teams, you know, through the tournament. So, you know, thank God for that. But uh, it wasn't always peaches and cream. I mean, it was it was a grind and a struggle. And I don't think a lot of people realize baseball is really not that glamorous. If you're having to travel, you know, the travel and the workload and perform in every night it's not that glamorous you're getting paid a lot of money but it's still it's like sometimes the compensation seems like 
I don't know if I can do this, you mm-hmm. know. And then, you know, you got the media and all that kind of stuff, but still, especially if you're slumping and something like that, it's like, eh. <laughs> you just got to keep playing, though. Yeah. You got to keep playing. And well, and to be there we through were. the struggle of it, I mean, losing, yes. you said 104 games or whatever, 102 games. Oh. And then to be there for the World Series championship, I mean, to be yeah. able to stick it out through that and, and see that through the organization has got to be special. It was. And you know what we said? And the greatest thing is like that any player would get to that place. It's like, when you think about it, I didn't think so much back to like 82, 81, 82 in the early years, but it's like, we did it. Mm-hmm. Just the relief of saying, man, we did it. We did it. Just looking back at spring training, I bet I've taken 500,000 ground balls, you know, and just, <laughs> you know, got this and got that and slumped here and did this. And it's like, you know what? We did it. Mm-hmm. And we did it our way. And, you know, to be able to experience that and feel that and release that, it's just like, man, that was that was worth it. Yeah, 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 no <laughs> doubt, no doubt. I mean, that's what we all it do. It wasn't even that's about what, the money or right? any of that. You know, the, well, ring, all, the ring is a big deal. For sure. Because that's forever. Mm-hmm. But it's like, it wasn't about the money. It was just like saying, man, that was a great season, a great team. And when we get together on reunions and stuff, it's like, it just happened. Yeah. You know, and that's an, I wish I could have experienced that with the Cardinals. Yeah. Well, and that's what we all play for. Because I know they for. have that. That's what we all play that's for, exactly right? When you're right. a kid. That's what you dream of is, is winning it. Very few get the opportunity That's to right. do it. And that that team, we had our 10-year reunion a couple of years ago, and it's funny. We It was like we were just – it it seemed like you were on the DL for a little bit and missed a road trip, and then all your guys came back, and we got back together. We were in the That's room. Same. All the jokes were still That's funny. Right. Everybody, everybody picked up right where right where they left off. And, um, you know, but that team is is a unique team that will always be That's bonded right. and, and gelled together, and very few get to experience that. Uh, something I I I also came across the amount of triple plays that you were involved with. I, can you explain that? Like you were you were involved in seven. I think one of them was you hit into it, so that's unfortunate. But I guess if you're gonna be a part of six fielding wise, you gotta you know hit into one every once in a while. But how in the heck is that happening? Two I were actually, in one inning. I actually played for it. one game. I actually played for it, and I you know I'm saying I at this particular time I didn't. It's kind of the the situation that the way it happened that way but i'd a lot of times tell the pitcher said if you can get me a ground ball i can do more with it on the field than anybody else you know mm-hmm. and then i would actually play in positions like okay if i can not have to take a step and reach and catch this ball i'm going to play close enough where i can get back gauge it where i can get back to the base and make a good throw to second you know it wasn't like i was playing to pull a whole lot but i anticipated kind of how my pitcher was pitching and who the hitter was and i determined i said if this ball's hit back backhand it's easy but I'm going to play in a position where if I can just reach out and grab it and not have to go that way to turn a double play, I'm going to, I'm going to grab it and try to get back here and gauge the speed of it to turn a triple play, and it happened. So the circumstances have to be right. Yeah. You know, the, obviously the hitter has to hit it your way, and you know, not be Willie McGee fast, and <laughs> you know, have it, you be able to handle it and make a good throw. And that's it's it's really weird, but. I mean, I, I try to pass that along to my, you know, my yeah. my younger kids that are playing now. It's like, you know what? Anticipate these kind of things. You never know. Yeah. You well, know? In communication with their pitcher, the trust yeah. of, hey, you can throw a sinker in here to this right-hander That's, and see if you can get it hit down the line know? here because I'm ready for it. And you don't have to fear it's going to be a double down the line clearing the bases. Right. I mean, that, I'm going to get that one. <laughs> but I actually told my second base, I, hey, ow, ow, hey, look, look, if he hits it down here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step. I'm trying to give him hands. So I'm gonna step here. And I'm gonna throw to you. Just give him a heads up. You yeah. Know? And keep and, it going. Uh, get it and get rid of it. And the base is loaded. I don't know. Bruno, one of my former teammates, hit into the first one. And then Jody Reed with the bases loaded hit into the second one in that particular game. And I was like, oh, we were just kind of laughing the second time. Hey, we're gonna let's do it again right here. <laughs> and it happened. It's like you know. And it's really a, it's a beautiful thing to see on television. You know. Yeah. A couple of the triple plays you usually get guys in rundowns. But a five four three right, right, is like right. pure, and it's yeah. just like it's got to happen the yeah. right way. Yeah. And we still don't know where the ball went on the second one. Oh, really? I have no idea. If Kent dropped it on the mound, or one of our coaches got it. But uh, they have a ball in in Cooperstown that says it was, a was triple from one. that game. Yeah. So yeah. I, I mean, I don't know whether it was or not. We were just have we were laughing about it. It's like that doesn't happen very often, no. does it? <laughs> Two triple plays in one game. That's amazing. So your time here in St. Louis, give me some names of some guys, some teammates, guys you were close with. Uh, rattle off some of the guys on that roster. McGee, mm-hmm. Ozzie, um, Mabry. Um, who's in center? That was Langford, Pagnazzi, Stoudemire, Bennis, both Bennis guys. Yeah. Um, Eckersley. That was really weird for me. 
There's my man Rip. He was he was on that team too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clubhouse Buddy Bates, yeah. McClubby. Yeah. yeah. But um, they had uh, Clayton, Royce Clayton. Yep. Alisaia. Um, I'm trying to think who else was in the outfield, but uh, so a lot of those guys. We, good. We do these fantasy camps. I mean, yep. Pagnazzi was a staple of it. Alisaia comes all the time. Uh, Ray Ray's in St. Louis all the time. Ozzy we see all the time. I mean, guys that are still you know involved in the organization and and. Uh, but I mean, those are those are legendary names. Yep. You know, obviously, obviously Willie and and all those guys. Um, what, who who were you close with? Who was your Danny Schaefer and I were yeah. really close. We got I, I we kind of had the same beliefs and and God and stuff like that. And then he turned me on to NASCAR. I'd never been to NASCAR before. <laughs> He's a big NASCAR guy from North Carolina, and and we still have a relationship in regards to you know the Cardinals and NASCAR and but. Um, you know, and Tony, actually, Tony and I had a little miniature book club that we'd he'd pass books back and forth to each other. La Russa, you know, he liked to mm-hmm, read and mm-hmm. give us something to talk about. But um, I liked all those guys, you know. I mean, I didn't know all of them, you know, real well. But, right. uh, you know, Tony Fossus, um, I'm trying to think who else was there. I'm trying to think some of the bullpen guys. I just, I know Eckersley was, I had. I had hated Dennis. Yeah, I was going to say. So yeah. many years, yeah, he's, he's the only guy that struck me out four times in a game. You know, and it's just a funny story. It's like, ah, just ah, forget it. After yeah. the fourth, I was like, and he was a real competitor, you know, and just facing him when he was closing and then being on the same team with him. You know, you get a different perspective and feel. And it's just like, you know, you just, you love it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because I never knew some of those things about him. And yet I just, I kind of hated him as a pitcher and because he'd always get me out and, he hated me, I'm sure, but it's like, you know, we went on and and it had a chance going to the series, you know, and it's just like, man, oh, man. Yeah, and you, we could sit and talk about it, you know, just like it happened yesterday. Yeah, yeah and the you guys know, that I you hate that. on the other side, are usually you hate them because they're really good. <laughs> and then yeah. when they, you, don't, you don't not like the guys that aren't good that you're getting hits off of. You love those guys, but, oh. you know, when they get on your team, it's a totally different perspective. And, and the cool thing is it's like, hey, man, we'll put everything past in the past and, you know, we, right. we're, what do we got to do to win? You know, yeah, where we, are we going from there? Well, there, there, at that time, there wasn't a lot of uh, movement as far as, like, free agent stuff like that. Yeah. So I'm saying a lot of times now, I mean, I moved quite a bit, so I got to be friends with a lot of guys that I played against, you know. But, you know, I was saying before that happened, I was like, everybody on that side was my enemy. You know what I'm saying? Even though I respected them and I liked them, but I wasn't going to show, you know, any of that. Now, Kirby Puckett, he was the best. He could butter up some pitchers and, oh, man, I'm not swinging very good, man. Take it easy on me tonight. And he'd rock, like rock he it. needed any help. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, so you you get done playing, uh, and then you spent a lot of time coaching. You know, coached Coaching in the Astros organization, made it to the big leagues as a hitting coach there for a while, uh, also independently. But talk about your experience of, uh, of coaching and, and staying in the game. Well, I wasn't sure after retiring what, you know, I, I – what I really liked was in my later years playing, being able to sit and talk to the younger players about situational baseball and different things that they might be going through and just, you know, just share experiences like, well, you know, I mean, I had this happen. I had, you know, I'm, I've gone through what you have, you know, so I felt like that was a kind of a leading to like, you know, I, I do want to coach. I like to be able to talk baseball and that. And then um, I actually started out with the Cardinals. 2001, I went down to uh, instructional league with uh, Joe Patini and yeah. Walt Jockety and them, and uh, Bruce Mano was the farm mm-hmm. director, and did the fall league with them. Yachty, Yachty was there his first year in pro ball, and you know they were babies, <laughs> you know, and I was kind of down there to help and you know hit and struck stuff like that. And then I thought I was going to have a job with the Cardinals, and it just didn't kind of work out. And the Astros called me. I was living in uh, Louisiana, and the Zephyrs, the AAA team, the Astros, is right across the lake, and. And uh, I'd called him and said, hey, if there's anything I can do, you know, I'm close by. I'd be glad to help you. So I ended up going to the interview, and I went to uh, Houston. I ended up – they made me a good offer, and I, I said, all right, I'm in. Triple-A hitting coach. Cardinals called me the next day. I said, man, <laughs> you just missed me by a day. You know, and I couldn't go back on it. But uh, that was kind of sad for me. But, you know, good experience with, the, you know, the Cardinals starting out like that. Yeah. And, the, and the Cardinals would invite you to spring training, too, you know, to be, a you know, like a celebrity coach mm-hmm, and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And that was a blast, you know, because Bob Gibson and Brock and all, they'd have them all come back. And that's the way it should be. Yeah. I don't think a lot of organizations do that, but I'm saying that was classic. Red Shandy's, Red Shandy's was a hard, he hit the hardest fungos you could even imagine, <laughs> even in his older age, you know what I'm saying? But then 
Ended up coaching with the Strohs uh, in AAA for a couple years, and then they made a bunch of changes. Went to, and it's still related to the Cardinals because we played the Cardinals those two years. The year I was called up to the big leagues, they beat us, and then the next year we beat them and went to the World Series. And it was just a lot of good stories there, but it's kind of ironic that it was against the Cardinals, yeah. you know. And then I got a really nice. Uh, actually, I ended up getting fired in 2006 after that, and went to uh, Tampa Bay coach triple a in uh durham and um that was a good experience and then um a job i started giving some lessons and then i a job came up in sugarland deacon jones who just recently passed away he he'd looked me up at uh, where i was giving lessons and just said hey would you be interested and i said hell heck yeah i said i a lot of people don't understand what this independent baseball is all about i'll do whatever you whatever i can to help you guys do this and they built a brand new stadium and then i interviewed for the job and got the job and absolutely loved managing the game hmm. i loved it i love giving guys you know another chance and you know i just i like being the guy sitting in that seat because i i tried it one time in the big leagues tom kelly let me manage with him i was like well this cra- this happens too fast i'm used <laughs> to just watching me and play you know playing defense for me and then when I come hit, I come hit. But it's like when you're watching the whole field, the defensive part of the game gets away from me real quick. Yeah. But I learned how to do it, you know, through coaching and stuff like that. And I absolutely love managing. I absolutely love managing where you can call, you can make the calls, and that's where you can draw on your experience and say, well, I'm, this is what's going to happen right here. Right. You know, and um, you know, I I'm probably too old to get started in it again, but um, that that would be my passion now. Is to manage again. Yeah. You know, and yet I'm thinking, computer? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I don't <laughs> yeah. know. <laughs> a little different than it is now than it, it's than it was. It's still a great then. game. I love coming yeah. out here and watching the big league. I've been watching minor league baseball and little league baseball. Oh, my yeah. Oh my goodness. To come out here and see these guys, and it's so fast, and it's so smooth, and yeah. it's just like, you know what? I used to do that, but I didn't, I didn't see it like that. And so you really appreciate the talent and just the, you know, the game itself. I mean, it's really a great game, and uh, to learn how to play it at that level is just—it's just—it's just phenomenal. Yeah, the I think, skill involved. And I think you get that appreciation the more you get away from it because you you realize Absolutely. how hard it is, and in yeah. the separation between these guys out here and those guys in AAA or AA or independent ball. I mean, it's a—it's a big gap that a lot of people don't realize unless you've been in it, seen That's right. it. And, you know, but you know, my son's nine. He plays, and my daughter's twelve, and she plays softball. And um, and and you you know, you like you said, you watch those games. You come out here. And I, I'll tell you, just that throw from third to first. Yeah. You know, you go stand out there, and you you know, back before when you were playing, you didn't think about it. Now you're like, oh my god, I need a cutoff man to get in from <laughs> third to first. And they're making these plays and make it look so easy yeah, and right. smooth. And I mean, even the hard well, we plays they make it look routine. Yeah, we used to do that. A lot of people talk. You know, the speed, the, the pitching is one thing. Speed of the pitching is one thing. But yeah. The way the ball comes off the bat and just how everybody runs and you know the anticipation of the plays and stuff like that that's it's hard to describe that to guys like say you're trying to describe it to guys in triple a it's going to speed up on you just a little bit yeah. you know what i'm saying and guys learn how to, you learn how to do it if you get a chance you learn how to do it and you get used to it just like i mean the worst thing ever in baseball is first year kid pitch that's the worst <laughs> I ever. Just went through it, and you know, it's like, how does anybody it. ever make it through this? And it, you know, what I'm saying, and I tell parents today too, and I, you know, I hope they're. Li- I said, if your son or daughter is good enough, they're gonna make it. Mm-hmm. They're gonna make it as long as they're, you know, good character guy, and they're hard workers and stay in school and you know do the right things. If you're if you're good enough, you'll make it. If you love it, mm-hmm. if you love it, you'll keep yourself in a position to to do that. You yeah. Know? Well, and, and, I, and it and naturally it. happens too, because like I remember being in rookie ball or a ball and I, I remember hearing the older guys talk about you know throwing throwing pitches to set up other pitches so i'm gonna exactly. throw i'm gonna throw this pitch here but i don't want you to hit it and i'm gonna get you out on that next pitch and i'm like man okay so i go out there and try to do that but i couldn't do it yeah. right i wasn't ready for it i didn't understand what it meant right and then all of a sudden you get to the big leagues you realize you're doing it That's without right. doing it That's you know right. you're not paying attention and trying to you're just naturally evolving and learning how that works so the speed That's of the game as you're in it and as you're growing and developing those things just happen and then you're able to 
to do those things and it becomes so, part of your game. That's right. But you don't realize that you don't work no, on it. No. You know, you don't you don't go, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna really work on throwing this waste fastball here to get out. You know, no. it's just you start learning, you give up a few hits, a few that's mistakes, it. and you you put that away and say, Okay, I'm gonna you know, start setting this up a little bit better. But um, you talk guys, about you talk about guys have that physical ability. Yeah. They don't they don't win the battle mentally and they don't learn like that the situation. I didn't learn how to hit in the big I mean I, I could hit I could hit anybody's fastball. I didn't learn how to hit till about six years in the big leagues. I was like, I go to Toronto and I wouldn't see a fastball and I, I had to make an adjustment. I had some veteran players give me some advice and then it became like, Oh, okay, mm-hmm. this is how the game is supposed to be played. But that's yeah. six years in the big leagues, right. you know. Yeah. So there's a lot of guys that were more talented than me that went up that ladder faster than me. Could throw 105. But then all of a sudden I passed them back and they were going down the ladder. I was going up the ladder in the mental side. That's what people, you know, George Kissel used to say there's never a dumb big leaguer. You know, that that there's never, never a guy out there in a big league uniform that's out there by mistake. I mean, they have something and possess something that. That that guys that aren't able to get there don't. That's, right. that's the mental side. That of it. is. That's, yeah. man, this is a toughness. That name, George <laughs> Kissel. I was so thankful that I got to really kind of know him in the limited time I had with the Cardinals. You know, in spring training, and then you know, I don't, I don't think he was in instructional league, but George was a baseball brain, and he didn't want to come across as a brain. He'd just tell you. You know how long it takes to check all your fielders? You know when you're sitting here. I, I never thought about it like that. It takes about two seconds to mm-hmm. just go through every number on the field, and I use that kind of stuff when I was managing. It's it's, and I still do today. I watch the game today. Just if I'll be in the suite tonight or whatever, I'll be watching. I'll be looking. I'll check the fielders. Man, I, I, man they're playing mm-hmm. way over here. You know, it's like anticipating stuff like that. So, thanks to those guys that you know continued on and passed along the game just those little tidbits that make a big difference and i know you had veteran guys that were telling you along the way what are you doing what are you what were you thinking right there mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying like, yeah so, come in here after after you, after you have a bad outing come in here let's watch video together yeah. you're like oh okay let me listen to you teach me through this through instead of me trying to figure out what i did wrong but you were in the prime of a couple of legendary names here you mentioned one of them i mentioned another we just talked about them, but red shandies george kissel and dave ricketts I mean, th- those three names. I mean, you were here in their prime. I was, I was here. Uh, Mr. Ricketts and I were very close. Uh, George Kissel, when I first showed up to Johnson City, Tennessee, I walk in and he's. I'll never forget. I walk in and he's sitting in the little coach's uh, office, kind of if you can call it that, by the washing machine. <laughs> then he's got on like the long underwear on and he's got no shirt on. He's got this big old scar down the middle of his chest from his surgery that he had and. And, and I'm like, man, that's George Kissel. You know, just the knowledge and experience he had. Red Shaney's, I mean, every day he'd get ready to come in. You know, we'd, he'd sit down and have lunch in there with us. He'd go out there with Tony. <clears throat> he'd, he'd, you know, Tony would come over and they'd talk every day and then Red go in and get yeah. dressed and go up. I've never seen George Kissel or Red Shaney's hit a bad fungo. And I've seen them hit a lot of fungos, but I've, they never messed one up. They were unbelievable. And I, as a pitcher, had to before I went to Peoria and low A, I in mm-hmm. spring training I had to go to George Kissel Fungo School yep. and learn how to hit fungos. Love two that. to three hops, backspin, hit it right here, then you gotta move them one to two steps. Right. Oh, you know, seven over here, seven over there. Um but man, those are guys that mean so much to me. But you were there in the prime. I mean they, obviously they had to have had an influence on, on oh, your of career. Course. I mean they were at spring training. Like I said, I wouldn't if it wasn't so if it didn't stand out in my mind so much, Red Shane could just he could just do whatever you want to do with the fungo, you know, and I seemed to be getting grounded from him every day in <laughs> St. Pete, and he was just wearing me out, you know. And he was having fun with it, yeah, you know. But that's an art. That's a lost art. That's not easy to do, you know. I mean, I still haven't, I haven't mastered the the bottom hand with the the right hand toss where you, you know, what I'm saying, mm-hmm. you know, what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. I still toss with my left hand and get my hand on on the bottom of the bat quick enough, but. Those guys that toss it have their bottom hand on the bat and they toss it up like, mm-hmm. you know what I'm yeah, talking about. It's exactly hard to describe, but they, I'm a left I mean, hand they flipper. hit some rockets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, like I said, it's an art, you know. And when you're coaching, you got you got to do it. I mean, I've seen some of my young guys trying to coach and teach some of my younger guys how to actually do that. It's hard. Yeah, you just got to figure out how to do it. But I mean, that's a big part of every day that you have at the ballpark, especially pitchers. Pitchers got to learn how to hit fungos. Mm-hmm. They have to, not in the big leagues, but I'm saying you have to learn that kind of stuff. And that's a big part of your routine every day. Somebody's got to hit your fungos and get your work and get ready for the game, you know. So 
those are those unseen things that people have no idea for the most part, but is would be invaluable to them if they could spend an hour in the clubhouse and see what the pregame routine and the ritual is of what it actually takes to be ready to play a game. Yeah. Well, and that's why a guy like you sticking around and coaching is so valuable because you've learned from so many of those guys your experience, but the, what those guys have poured into you Absolutely. that you can now pass along, um, you know, which is why I'm coaching my kids and that's you know right. my daughter and my son to be able to pass those things on. But I constantly am reminded of things that I heard from George Kissel or, you know, Dave Ricketts on the catching side and working Dave with Ricketts Mike Matheny. Dave was the man. Unbelievable. I'm, I'm telling you, my first that instructional league in St. Louis in the first year in um, Jupiter, I ain't kidding. He had he had his catchers down in the cage at like daylight. <laughs> you can never daylight, beat Mr. Ricketts to the field. And <laughs> he was, and that's why Yachty is as good as he yep. is, and those guys have always been that good. Ricketts. You ever heard the story about Yachty and Mr. Ricketts and Mike Matheny? <sighs> I don't know that I have. So but. Yachty's in camp, and uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Ricketts comes, and, and he gets he gets Mike Matheny, and he says, jump in the cart. I'm going to take you back. I'm going to show you something. He jumps in the cart, and they go back to the minor league fields there on the quad in Jupiter, and uh, – they pull up to this game, and Yachty's catching. He said, that's going to be the best catcher in baseball. Ooh. And Mike said, I look at him, and he said, no he way. can't move. He's got terrible hips. He can't squat. He can't get down into a stance. And he's like, what? He's like, I'm telling you, he's going to be the best catcher in baseball. And Mike's like, I don't know. Okay. I don't know about that. And he comes back. And so I talked to Yachty about it um, on a podcast we did last year with him and Wayno together. And we talked about Mr. Rick, and he started tearing up because yeah. he means so much to him. And he said, Mr. Ricketts was so hard on me, and he came and he got me, and he took me every morning in the cage, and he made me stretch, and he made me get in my stance, and he, he, would, he would pry my legs open and try to get me to open my hips up and get into my stance. But he said he believed in me in such an early age um, and put the time and, and, and was hard on me. You know, at the time, I didn't appreciate it, and I didn't know it. And then, obviously, we That's know awesome. how good he turned out. But, you know, Mr. Ricketts was that guy that he just had so much experience uh, Mike Matheny always said he'd try to get there and beat him in spring training. He said, I'm going to beat him. <laughs> he, he goes, I'd show up at 4 o'clock, yeah. and I'd, my headlights would come, and I'd see the little reflectors on his shoes. He'd be out there walking. And the, he's like, man, I can't. you can't beat him here. No. But um, another great story about Mr. Riggis is in, in the off season, we would all work out at Maryville University. Or, mm-hmm. They all. Mm-hmm. I was a minor league kid at the time, and they invited me to come be a part of it. And Mr. Ricketts would, would work with uh, Mike, when when he was ready to start catching and he would just come and hang out he'd also be working with maryville university softball team and the baseball team and at the end mike would tip all the guys that you know helped him and and he gave uh gave mr ricketts a a check and when mr ricketts passed away his wife called mike and he said we went through his wallet and that check that you wrote him is still in his wallet because he said he would never take a penny from you boys he said he loved working with you guys he didn't do it for the money. He did it because he absolutely loved being out there. That's why he's working with the Maryville University catchers and the, and the baseball, you know, catchers and all that kind of stuff. And um, so that's the kind of guys that built this organization. That's absolutely. And and uh, and set it for so that I could enjoy it, so that you could have success and go on that's and right. do that. But uh, some great stories about guys that I love uh, mean a ton to, to 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 me personally and. I always enjoy getting guys that have been around them because there's a different. You know, as soon as you say a name, you're like, oh my, you know, like. Yeah me and you understand it differently than right. than people that kind of came past them but uh, you know what those guys like meant. to go back and do it again yeah you know and actually not even be a player but just be able to watch you know when i'm i'm saying being a player took some attention away from like seeing that kind of stuff but i did see it, it as like thank god for people like that you know that yeah. just have that in their heart to do that you know 70 plus years of, in, in the game you know it's hard to replace that experience and what's weird for me is like when I grew up over here, I, hearing those names every single day <laughs> and then getting to be a part of it, yeah. it was just like, it doesn't get any better than that yeah. for me. Absolutely. Know? Well, Trying Gary, to not cry. Yeah, I hear know? you. I hear you. Uh, Gary, I hope you enjoy your, your time here with your family. I know you, you got a bunch of your family here, right? You're going to enjoy the game tonight? <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, it's bobblehead night or whatever it was. It was like... <laughs> When everybody in the family heard about it, it's like it became their night now. It's like, well, all right, I'll try to I'll try to fit into your night if that's what you want it to be. But that's who uh, the people in my hometown, and I always kind of joke around a little bit because everybody's such a Cardinals fan. There's a there's a, if you're a Cubs fan, you're kind of like I don't know if you're White Sox fan, you're just out. Yeah. 
but I'm just saying there's so much Cardinals around here, you know, and I, we have hit tracks and it's like, well, what stadium would you like to hit in today? <laughs> and it's always the same thing, Bush. And we're just like, boo. Nobody ever picks, you know, Minnesota or, you know, any Yankee Stadium or anything. It's always the Cardinals. Cardinals, 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 Cardinals. And I grew up that that same exact way and I understand that, you yep. know. And it's always going to be like that. It's always going to be like that. Yep. And that's because of what you're talking about, you know, that's they're committed and they've surrounded themselves with people that, that do it the right way. And it's, you know, even though this year's a little bit off, it's, I'm not worried about the Cardinals. Yeah. You know yeah, they got a good track record. We'll be all right. They, they need to know they got a whole bunch of people that support them and they live and die with them. It's like, oh my God, my mother in law's one of them. It's like, <laughs> well, quit front running, okay? Look, you got to take some of the good with the bad. That's but right. You know what? Thank God for the Cardinals, really. Yeah. It's a great organization. Well, we're, we're glad you're back and, and get to be celebrated by the fans here and yeah. hope you enjoy your time and, and look forward to seeing you back yeah. here in the future. But and, thanks for your time and, and, uh, well, you're welcome. And you know what? Last time I did this, you know how far the pitcher's mound looks from home plate? <laughs> yeah, you got the first I pitch tonight. I need binoculars. <laughs> can, I make, can I get it there? <laughs> well, don't 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 cop out. I always tell people, when you get the first pitch, you got to go up on the mound. you got to stand on the top. Don't, I had don't to go short. deal with that in my mind the last time I said, if I don't go up on the mound, gotta I'm go. going to be the biggest. Yeah, you got to go. <laughs> you got to go. Whatever you want to <laughs> yeah, call right. it, if I don't do that. And when I got up there, I was like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. So just I'd put like some air some, under. I like to have some practice throws, but anyway, <laughs> put some air under. It's it. all good. I, yeah. I mean, I just slow it. I, and I down there on the field, I see you know uh, John Hewlett and those guys yep. that I've known and here and all that kind of stuff. It's just a blast. Yeah. So thank you. Absolutely. Well, that wraps up this edition of the Chatters Box. Thank you so much for listening. You can listen to all of our previous podcasts uh, that we've done through last year and this season anywhere you get your podcasts on any platform. Check out the Chatters Box podcast. And thanks for listening.